is from Psalm 36. Psalm 36. And I'll read from verse 5 of Psalm 36. And I'll just read a few verses. And starting in Psalm 36, read from verse 5. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep, O Lord. Thou preserveth man and beast. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. And thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. For with thee, is the fountain of life, and in thy light shall we see light. Amen. And God will bless his reading of that word. Now the verse I'll be speaking on later on, I'll touch on anyways. Verse 9, for with thee is the fountain of life, and in thy light we shall see the light. You know, sometimes the rest of the picture will realize that when you're going to speak in revival, where do we look for, for inspiration? Who do they look for to encourage us? And sometimes to even rebuke us, but to encourage us to pray for revival. You could say, well, Acts 2 is a good one, John. Well, I have I spoken Acts 2 before. The Acts 2 when the day of Pentecost came. Well, maybe they did that. And sometimes looking at, I've looked also at past revivals in nations. And even in this nation, if you think of it, I'll spend a few moments to tell you some of the past nations that we've had in this nation of Scotland. The Lewis Revival is probably the most recent, uh, 49, into the 40, early 40s, 50s, Lewis Revival under Duncan Campbell was a mighty move of God. And we give God thanks for that. You've probably many of you read of how God moved and God started speaking to people. And it was amazing how the churches were filling and places of all the people were emptying. Not there was many of them, but it was happening anyway. If you think further back, there was a Cambus slang revival under Whitfield, that is 1740, 1742 or something. The Campbell slang revival was a mighty move of God where thousands upon thousands of people were reckon that Whitfield preached to 20,000 in the open air. Now that was without equipment, no no microphones, nothing like that, just a natural voice. And then there was a revival before that in 1630, the kick of shots under a uh, John Livingston, another young man, mighty move of God, and it was a great move of God there. And then one that Emily knows much about, and those of you for this area, Cooksyth, Thomas Chalmers Burns. That was a way back in 1839, it started. There was another one came early on in the 19th century. It was a touch there. But it was amazing. God moved. Now, God definitely did move in a mighty way. And then there was, if you think of further on in the early 1900s, a Charlotte Chapel in Edinburgh was one. A Pastor Kemp was the pastor at that time. There was a mighty move of God there. Eventually, we had, they had nightly meetings. Every night there was meetings on because God was moving. And then we can bring it even into Glasgow. Peter McCrusty, in the 20s, Tenor Hall. People say that wasn't really a revival. Well, there was 2,000 people went on a Saturday night. Every Saturday evening to that service. So it was God was moving there. And then it was Jock Troop days. The Jock Troop was involved in the Fisherman's Revival up north in 1921. Now, they're, they're fairly recent to us. And it's good to look back and see how God has moved and how God has moved in the nation. But the question I asked ourselves, what about now? What about now? What about this moment? We look around. What do we see when we look around? We see death. Now, I'm not just talking about the virus here. We see that as well. But we see death. We see darkness. We see blackness. We see apathy. We see indifference. We see compromise. Churches empty, no doubt about it. Mission halls, I mentioned some of them. Tent Hall, Bethany Hall, they're all gone. 
they're finished, gone. Open the ears were plentiful, and Glasgow at one time, they're all gone. And this is why we gather, brothers and sisters, because we look to see these days return, because God is still on the throne. God is still on the throne. So the little verse, thinking in these things, if you think in these things, I spoke about how God has moved. I mentioned these names because it all took place in our nation, our little nation. Verse 9, for with thee is a fountain of life, and in thy light shall we see light. The fountain is a source from which all life flows. Now, God is that source from which all life flows. All that is called real life, that is real life. I don't mean just being alive, like animals are alive, but men who have life, and that life, although given by their parents, they're born, but there's something else being given them. They'll see how later on the spirit being given by God. And that's life. That's real life. We see it. What we look around, we see, well, we see men and women today that are existing. The majority of men and women are existing. They're in true existence without God, without hope. And they seem to be quite content with that life. Little realizing that they're missing the greatest thing of all, to be a son of God. And revival break, begins to bring these thoughts to the minds and the hearts of men and women. You see, all spiritual life comes from God. That is everything spiritual comes from God. See, I've mentioned this before, you've heard me some of the brethren, we are spirits with a body. We're not a body with a spirit. Initially, we're spirits with a body. The main part of us is the spirit part, because the body part will die. It's dying and out. I mean, you're looking at my face and you may be saying, John, I remember your face 40 years ago as a wee bit sagged down a wee bit. Your bits down there are coming down. The eyes are going a wee bit. Your hair is maybe getting a wee bit worse than it was. But you see, we're spirits alive and that will go on. And that's what we have to pray. God will divide the spirits of men and women. You see, our bodies, our flesh comes from our parents, but our spirits has its origin in God. Remember that our spirits is already in God. And when we are, we are saved, what happens when we're saved? The spirits revive. And that does revive the body as well. There's no doubt about it. It revives the body. There's joy comes in. There's, there's sometime before that, there's sorrow comes in, sorrow for sin. But God revives spirits first. So it says, and in his light, we shall see light. You know, it's amazing the songs that's been written about light. I saw the light once I was blind, but now I can see. Praise the Lord. It was, a, was something like that. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. And the man in John 9, I think it's around about verse 9. I'm not sure the verse, but he was asked by the, he was asked by the religious people, what do you mean you were blind and now you see? What do you mean you were blind? Eventually, get his parents, and his parents says, No, he was born that way. And the man gets fed up, he just could say, Well, all I know is this once I was blind, but now I can see. For in thy light, we see light. He was seeing light, not only physically, but he was seeing light spiritually as well. Because God is the source of this light. God, the one we're going to pray to tonight, we're mighty God, we're eternal king, we pray to him, he's the source of this light. And when his light shines in darkened hearts, that's when we're now able to really see. When God shined in my darkened heart, I was really, for the first time in all these years, I really saw, I saw the light, I saw his light. You see, he is light and he is life. I mentioned it earlier on. Jesus says in John 8 and 12, I am the light of the world. It's him. It's all based on him as a light. Brothers and sisters, remember it. In him was life and the life was the light of men, John 1. In him was life. And it says in the verse, that's John 1 and 4, it says in verse 9, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. To the believer, 
by looking to that light, by meditating upon the character of himself by the light, by meditating upon the light, we can be surrounded by light because he is light. And because he is light and we've got spirits with bodies, with, with spirits with our body, that spirit can be so touched, it's surrounded by this wonderful light. For with thee is a fountain of life, as the text says, and in thy light we shall see light. You see, it's always we get near God, we get more light. Away from God, there is darkness. So a backslider, the further away from God, the darker he gets. The darker his heart gets, the darker his spirit gets, he's from God. He's away from God. And we're far from God, we're in darkness. And revival is a light shining in the darkness. That's what revival is. God's light shining in the darkness. You know, I read a story of a church, three or four hundred people in it. Men with darkened hearts. It could have been canvas long shots, the places I mentioned, could be only in any places. But light came in and hearts were flooded with light. When Jonathan Edwards preached the sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, men's hearts were filled with light. First of all, the light showed the sinfulness of sin. And then the light showed the glory of the amazing grace of God. Light lightens up dark and sad. Brothers and sisters in this city, in this nation, there's people, many millions with darkened hearts. And we've got to pray, Lord, bring your light. Send forth your light and your truth into darkened hearts. I mentioned this before when Brainerd preached to Indians the American Indians, using an interpreter who was drunk, unconverted man, such was the power of the word. As he preached to these people, the interpreter was drunk, but God took his word. And Brainerd stood back and he was amazed. As the light began to flood that room, that little hall, men's hearts began to trouble them as their darkened hearts, as the light revealed their darkened hearts. And all they were crying out for salvation, were crying out for mercy, were crying out for all these things. And this is what God, this is what God does. You see, they were frightened of the glaring light. And when God comes in and reveals them, so various things happen. First of all, men can be frightened. It can reveal their darkened hearts. It can reveal hearts without God. It can reveal sin, but it reveals something else. It reveals his joy. A person could be totally cast down because of his light, because of sin, and the light suddenly floods his soul, and he knows it, he realizes it. And that's what we are praying for tonight, the light showing their darkness. You see, men have to be enlightened by his light. In thy light we shall see light, the scripture says. No man can illuminate his own soul. No man can own his soul, but praise God, God can. And that's why we've gathered to pray. We've got to have this confidence, this belief in God, that even our prayers, even the most stuttering of prayers, if you feel, I can only say a few words, but it's prayers to God, that God will hear these prayers as he has done in the past. I think I mentioned the last time I was speaking, in the beginning God says, let there be light. And there was light, and God divided the light from the darkness. And through that light, his creation was seen. His creation was seen. And when God speaks light into hearts through the word, what do men see? A second time I mention this. They see the darkness of their sin. They see the need of salvation. And they behold the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, this should give us confidence, whether we're in the church at present or in Zoom, this should give us confidence to believe God, to pray. Because that's the greatest thing about prayer. We're praying that God's word would touch the hearts of men and 
women. And this God's word will indeed bring light to hardened hearts. As it says, it happened in Coxide, Campus Lang Lewis. I mean, Emily probably knows probably more than Andrean of the revival in Coxyth. It's probably still to this day, well, not so much now, but it was seen for a long, long time, the marks of that revival. It went on for many, many years. That, that town was dry for many years. It was dry for many years because of that mighty move of God. You know, I read in one of the movements up north, I can't remember who it was under, I can't remember the preacher. I'm talking the beginning of the century, the 20s. The preacher preached a congregation of about three or four hundred people. Such was a power that night that when night time came, there was a thousand people there in the church to hear him. In a few hours, that went out. No many phones in eight days, no phones, nothing like that. That went out, and there was a thousand people waiting to hear the word of God that evening. For with thee is a fountain of life, and then thy light we shall see light. Jesus, the word of life, he's a logos, he's a light. It says in John 1 and 5, the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That simply means the light keeps shining in darkness, and the darkness can never put it out. The darkness can never put out the light of God's word. That should give us confidence. The darkness can never put out the light of God's word. And this is why we've come to remember to pray for the Bible. That the darkness, as we see it, as we gaze around and we see this terrible darkness, it can sometimes discourage you, some cast, but the darkness cannot put out the light of God's word. Impossible. And over the many years, I look back to the times in the open air and things like that, where I've spoke to people and I just know that God has spoken to them. Their darkened hearts, their darkened souls, and all was was the word of God. I don't mean only the word of God. That's awesome, the word of God. But it's the word of God. Somebody passing by, you've often heard me explain that a young man it was a great blessing to me, the young man who was a drug addict. And I was preaching at the time, and after the service, he came over and spoke to me, and I prayed with him. And I prayed, and I know he began, he began to shake and all that, realized, and I spoke to him. Well, anyway, 20 years later, he approached me again. He said, I thought I would tell you, I was passing by the open air, I haven't been in this area for years. That night, you spoke to me. Light touched my darkened heart. And he's been a Christian for nearly 25 years. Now that's, that gives you blessings. That gives you a great blessing, what God can do. And when I think of these revivals, which happened in our nation, I, 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 more, I used all the ones, that's only some of them. Up the East Coast as well, in the early part of the century, was a mighty move of God. God moved. I mean, we probably seen to a certain extent, the not the revival, but we've seen the, the, the fruit the mission halls that were full, tent hall, for instance, 2,000 people sometime on a Saturday evening, Sunday evening, a, in, in the church, tent hall, a mission hall. Bethany Hall as well as the one Jack used to go to, Jack Bill, it was crowded. At one time it was crowded by, it was a fair size of hall as well, because God had moved in this city. And can you do it again? Yes, he can do it again, because he's still on the throne. He still reigns. So we've came together, Zion Baptists, a fellowship of God's people. We've came to, we've listened to our sister sang, singing at Westers. We've listened to the word of God. I mentioned that little scripture, for with thee is a fountain of life, and in thy light we shall see light. It's all about light. It is a dark city. I know I'm repeating myself, but I'm going on here. It is a dark city, dark in hearts, but we have the light of the word of God. And we've got to pray that God will use his word 
whether it be through these meetings in Zoom going on, or when we go back into the open air in Edinburgh, all the tracks went out, God will move again in this city and in this nation of Scotland. Can you do it? I believe you can. I believe you can still do it. Sometimes you can come in week by week, your head maybe go down and say, well, John was praying and nothing seems to be happening, but you trust God. Because sometimes when I mentioned these times of revival, sometimes it was many, many years in between before God moved again. But God has always moved in this nation. He's moved in this nation sometimes in greater ways than others. The last ones where we, we could, as far as we know, was in the 50s. That was in a, the, the, the islands. That was in the islands. That was Lewis. That was the island where God moved in a mighty way. He's moved since then. He's touched lives. He's saved people. But that was in a mighty way. God can do it again. Brothers and sisters, let's pray for the Bible. If you want to pray for Joanna, good. Do that. I don't say you can still do that. Pray for and I don't say pray. She's asked for prayer. So we'll try and remember her. And prayer, she's had, had a bad time, obviously, and through that as well, you know the type of work she does among these people, and now as well as the COVID that hit with these storms, which has devastated some of the homes. So let's come now in prayer.